Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Hello and welcome to another episode of GoTo Unscripted. We're here in uh, GoTo Copenhagen, and I'm joined by the wonderful Christian Clausen, who's from Denmark. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, yeah. My name is Christian. I'm from Aarhus. Uh, I've written a book called Five Lines of Code. Well, that's what I wanted yeah. to pick up on. This, I was speaking to uh, some people who'd come uh, from another country, and they were from a huge big bank, and they said, "I said, was GoTo Copenhagen uh, useful this morning?" And they said, "We've been to two uh, two sessions, and one of them was particularly amazing, and it was Five Lines of Code." And I said, "I'd noticed the title, and I wanted to dive into what does Five Lines of Code mean." So, yeah, you've written a book, Five Lines of Code. Uh, is that all the code we're ever going to write? It's the length of a method. It's, a, mm. it's a, of course, it's to be a little bit controversial and to be a little bit catchy in the title. Of but mm. it's also because uh, I find I found that uh, for a long time I've been a very strong advocate that we need more quality and we need more refactoring and we need people to do it. And I've been wondering. I find it super amazing to have a clean code base, and it's super fun to work with. Like, why are people not doing it then? Why is no? Uh, do we have all these legacy code bases? Why do, does no one fix it? And so for many years, I was recommending books like Clean Code and uh, uh, Martin Fowler's Refactoring Book and stuff. But I, what I found was every time people came back and they said, yeah, they're, they're good books. And I'm like, OK, do you do it then in your work? And they're like, nah, it's a bit, it doesn't fit, or it's a bit difficult. I can't get started with it. I don't quite have a, a good handhold on, on the things. And I'm like, well, but there's a code smells, right? They, they say exactly where you need to, to fix stuff. And people were still like, yeah, but it's like it says, uh, don't have long methods. That's the classical one, right? But if you have just two seniors on a team, having them agree on what a what what is too long is impossible already. But then you have sometimes up to five or nine people on a team that didn't have to agree. And so what I figured was, what if I sit down and I digest all of the code smells into some nice, concrete, actionable rules that people can then easily follow and spot without having to think about extra stuff and adding extra complexity. And so the first rule I came up with was five lines of code. Like um, I said, that's when a method is too long, it's, it's past five lines. OK, so, so it's not about necessarily vastly reducing the amount of code and trying to encapsulate your business logic only into five lines. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's splitting up a bigger code, code base, using more methods, using uh, better classes, I would presume, as well. And is that for more understandable code, so it's uh, other people can uh, other people can iterate on it, and other people can understand it? Or what is what is the sort of end goal of thinking in these in the five lines of code? That's a very interesting point, and especially because I, I sort of split in split architecture into a few different categories. One of the uh, degrees, or one of the barriers where where I split it is. Uh, to, to make it more readable or to make it more maintainable. Because uh, there's a, a lot of confusion between these two, and if people don't distinguish between the two, they'll, they'll, uh, they have different sorts of impact and different sca uh, scopes. So for instance, something like where you're um, improving the naming of variables or method names, that makes the code more readable, for sure. But it has no impact on the architecture and on the maintainability of that code, because it's still connected to other things. And that's because the maintainability depends largely on two things, uh, the coupling to other things and invariants in the code that you need both are things you need to keep track of while you're working with it and so I focus almost entirely on um, the maintainability aspect and actually having the architecture be improved and I, I think I have a small section about naming things but I really really tried hard not to talk about it because naming is notoriously unsolvable uh, and and it's really difficult and I can't do better than Dan North already has done with this uh, with his paper uh, they call things, uh, 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 I don't even remember what it's called, but it's a, it's a really good article he has on it. So how would you th explain to people who are thinking, 
more methods, more that's actually adding more complexity my, to my code. You want less coupling, which means interdependent systems. There's then a communication channel between those separate systems. I'm now then talking about microservices. I've then got to handle additional complexity. So on one hand, you've got simplicity of the understandable and maintainability of your code, but your code is talking to other bits of code across something else. Yeah, and and I love uh, especially love a quote by, by um, John Carmack who who said that you can trade perceived complexity for actual complexity, right? Adding another layer of indirection will make the code more difficult to understand, but it will make it seem simpler. And so I also like to talk about two different types of abstraction. There is true abstraction where I don't where I'll never need to get underneath and look at what's under the abstraction. Then there's a true abstraction and it has truly removed some complexity that I never need to think about. And then there's shallow abstraction where uh, you need to somehow go around it or you need to know what's underneath to truly use it and stuff. And that's where all of the layered architectures I've seen in re the real world have been shallow abstractions. People always found a way to sort of go underneath or like they just expose some of the secret data or the platform underneath. Um, so so it's, it's very different whether you have these things where you can actually abstract away stuff and make it actually simpler. And the way that I sort of enforce that, that those are the types of abstractions done through my book is by having the, the invariants be the thing that we're abstracting into. So all of the code will go to where the invariants are, localizing them and making sure that you don't need to at least keep track of them in other classes and in other places. Um, as you say, I split up large piece of code bases into uh, all of these uh, hundreds of uh, smaller methods. Uh, in fact, it doesn't make it shorter at all. It makes it a lot, a lot longer in the beginning, especially. But then I use all of the methods to guide where all of the classes should go, because then if methods concern the same thing, like if they have a common suffix or prefix, probably they should be in a class that has that suffix or prefix, right, as its name. And then over time, you get a lot of classes also. And then you look at the classes and see, well, some of these can have the same thing in the title that's other thing, so probably there should be a package, right? We have this amazing hierarchy that we're barely using in a lot of cases where code can just talk to all different parts of the code, but if we start pushing it out and distributing it, it'll look much more like a tree structure, and you only have to consider the, the leaf that you're in uh, for the code, because that's where the invariants are, that's where the data is. Because I know a lot of people struggle from a sort of monolith to microservice migration. <clears throat> and I think part of it is because the monolith does get so unwieldy that you don't understand. So I, I can super see this idea of a tree structure that even if you do have a monolith, that is much more easy to reason about and you can understand which part of the tree and which part of the leaves you are within a monolith. But then I suppose if your monolith does get too big and you are coming up against some sort of ceiling in terms of scalability, that if everything is named correctly, not that the naming is important, but everything is classed and methoded correctly, then that does make it simpler to split out? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably it will. It, it will also, there's another interesting factor that I find a lot of people struggle with when they talk about this, this journey from monolith to, to microservices. And it's that latency becomes a thing. And it wasn't a thing before, right? When you're on a CPU, you can have these manager classes, which is a smell in itself, where that pull all the data to where they are, and then they do, all of the, uh, <laughs> they do all the calculations and then they deliver the result to somewhere else. That doesn't work in a, in a microservice architecture because you now are not on the same chip anymore and it, there might be latency between each of these calls and so collecting all the data is vastly inefficient. So uh, in my book I talk about this as pull-based architecture where you're pulling all the information to one place and instead uh, I describe how you shift your code to be more push-based where instead of, uh, if I know that I need to perform a calculation at this point, I, I'll pack up all the information that I have that's relevant for this thing and send it to the next service that can then uh, keep putting on more, uh, decorating more data, more data until the final uh, link in the chain will know how to actually perform the calculation and there will be no need to, to return it anywhere. You just return it directly to the next place it needs to go. So it's a much more push-based, much more for, forward uh, type of architecture that then passes information along. Um, and does this chain. tie into how we used to and still do think about event-driven architectures? Yes, very much. <coughs> because And I'm also a huge uh, uh, advocate for doing event-driven architectures because I, I, I can't see how direct microservices can be 
viable in, in a real setting due to exactly the latency and the coupling that you have between the components. The fact is, uh, classes and code services tend to grow over time. And at some point, we need to cut them up into two uh, components. And if you have a direct microservice where the caller knows where the callee is, then you can't split it up without having two teams work together, or three or more, and that's impossible. Teams, whenever we introduce handoffs, we know quality uh, suffers every single time. So how do you then explain these concepts with people who get very tied up to do with state and storing state and managing state in a database? And I know with events, you can do events uh, state transfer. How do people move information through their application and handle state in this disaggregated world? I won't claim that I'm a, a, an expert on how to handle state. I'm also, uh, of course, a huge fan of stateless things, and I would want to think about my services as pure functions in some abstract sense, where so they ha they can't contain any state. Um, but then uh, I have these databases, and especially since it's become very popular to talk about least privilege and stuff like that, I find that we know how to handle databases. And so far, I haven't been uh, offended by anyone who wants to just share the link to a database and then do the access control there. And then the events are more notifications that you need to do some work, go to the database and see. So you still have a very nice and finely grained uh, control over who has access to what, at what points. Uh, and you can also still transfer like huge amounts of data is really annoying if you have a message queue because you're capped at something like 10 megabytes usually, uh, which is understandable, but sometimes we have a lot more data that we want to communicate between them. So putting it in a common place first and then say just sending the, the events as notifications instead that other people need to then go and, and fetch it, I find is, uh, it is all right. It does, put a, 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 it does introduce coupling between the services on the data, but it's if, so long as we keep it simpler than it was before, it's not like I'm sharing references to different uh, databases from different teams. Um, but I can share data in that way, sort of a read-only type of data. And I suppose <clears throat> there are some architectures where you can have a local cache or a local copy of the data while you're doing some processing. And uh, I know you do have some eventual consistency possible issues. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, these are different ways that you can have localized state. Yeah. I. I uh, I do say that when you have shared uh, databases like this, you can have as many read keys as you want. You can only have one write key. Yeah. There is one owner of all pieces of data in all systems. And also, there is one team owning all, all code. Uh, also, there can't be shared code. You can't have shared data. That's not a thing, because that's a coupling, and it's going to kill your entire productivity and stuff. But so long as you, uh, you, uh, the data is read only, I haven't found a lot of issues with actually distributing that between many teams. OK. How do sort of uh, application integration patterns fit into this? Because we're talking about abstractions, and we're talking about a sort of common language that people are going to talk about these things communicating. What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, so for me, I've thought about architecture f so long and in so many uh, different in so many different contexts that it's all sort of become the same thing. It seems like when people talk about functional programming, or object oriented programming, or the old style of refactoring, or uh, the new, and all of these different things, we're all advocating the same thing, really. Like when 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 we talk about how people used to code in com even purely object oriented languages like Smalltalk and stuff, it's the same principles that I'm trying to revive now. So I, I've been meeting some very old programmers who, who were like, well, I used to do a small talk and stuff in there. We didn't have all these problems. I'm like, no, I know, because that's what my book Everything is about, the same style. Again, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's it's the same thing. And exactly, when, when I'm talking about we need more methods so we can have more classes, so we can have more packages, that would be a monolith kind of way to say it. But we could say the exact same thing about services, right? Because we add more um, features or more uh, hooks to the events. That would be like the methods. And then the class is the service. And then over time, you need to split those up as well in exactly the same way. So for me, it's all... It's all sort of the same thing that we're going through just in, in a different scope. Mm. It is I, all I like the, the wording that you're using as well, because you, you are talking within a sort of single programming construct of things like uh, events and, uh, and coupling and using services. <clears throat> because I work with AWS on the serverless kind of side, that's our sort of whole light bulb moment we're trying to spark in other people, that you have um, code and bits of functions and you have message buses that you need or message buses queues event routers anything to send messages across applications and i very much like the like the language that you're using from an individual programming language perspective because for me that 
that's applicable in the cloud as well, that you want to reduce your code, and you want it to scale up, scale down as much as you can, and use managed services if you can, so you're not reinventing the wheel, building additional infrastructure, all these hooks and additional integration things, which you really don't need to, and it's, it's ultimately not important for your business. You want to run your business code. Yeah, exactly. The user need is just to have the code be run, and everything else is a distraction, right? Everything that doesn't add a value, I also try to eliminate from every process. So, like a, a typical example that I've met in my work as a consultant would be something like Scrum meetings, and a lot of people do them, and I'm like, okay, are they valuable? Do you learn something? Like, are they useful for you? And so many developers hate them, and that I take that as an immediate feedback that they're probably not uh, valuable, right? Because developers like their job, like they like doing the right thing. Uh, and so remove that stuff. Infrastructure would be the same thing, right? It's like, do I need to know how to set up a, a network? Do I need to know how to build images in Docker to just run my like my Node uh, JS application? Maybe not, right? Maybe I just need to push this to somewhere, and then it's just it'll be run. I don't have to deal with all those uh, details and extra cognitive uh, load. Yeah, it's a term at AWS you use the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Um, and I was re-listening to a podcast recently. I'm thinking of something, does it make your beer taste better? If you're a beer brewing company, is the, whatever you're going to be building in your application, does it make your product better or is that a, a distraction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You were mentioning um, before we were talking uh, about your sort of language of choice that you like, and you were mentioning TypeScript. Talk us through why, why TypeScript uh, gets your neurons firing. Yeah, so TypeScript has many things going for it. First of all, of course, I'm a type guy. I'm very big in, uh, in type uh, languages, and TypeScript has one of the most fascinating uh, types uh, systems that humans have uh, conceived, which is already amazing for me. I've worked with the very uh, top, uh, di most difficult uh, type systems, like sort of dependent types, and sort of the Microsoft uh, has this lean thing they're coming up with. Up with. In France, there's uh, the language Coq, and in um, uh, and then there is also Acta and, and a lot of other things. And I and I really like these languages because I can teach the type system anything. I can have another program on top checking that my program is is valid at compile time, so I don't need to run it. And, and that's also a bit of a joke from when I was doing research that um, performance is where people want to run their code. I just want to type check them. Everything else doesn't matter, right? Then I know they're correct. Uh, so TypeScript has an amazing type system. It also has very low startup time, which is especially interesting if you're moving towards a sort of serverless world where the virtual machine is just up and then you don't need to wait for it. Um, so that's also uh, something I find very useful. And then it's just, there are libraries for everything. Everything is just, it's, it's a very nice, easy entry point, right? You can also, even if you're using JavaScript now, you can just rename all the files to TS and then add types gradually. And so I found it has a lot of things that make it really nice to work with in a professional setting. So the sort of onboarding and migration process you find is, is natural from some people who are doing JavaScript already rename your files and then start adding the types in and you're already improving your application. Yeah, but also uh, for people like uh, people who are familiar with Java or C Sharp or other object-oriented language because it is very inspired Type, yeah. by them and and it's and you know it looks the same the syntax is fairly similar. Uh, I haven't so my book is written in TypeScript and I haven't um, presented it to a Java programmer who wasn't like oh yeah this is exactly the same. I mean there there are some quirks here and there and I explain them but it's in general it's just a really it's a really nice language to work with. Okay. Except for the runtime of course. Okay. <laughs> um, so two two parts uh, I was going to ask the question what would you advise people to do f first thing to improve their architecture but I think the first thing they should do is first of all buy your book because uh, that'll be useful and give give them a whole bunch of information more than we can just cover in the, <coughs> in this in this chat. But yeah Tomorrow, if some developer wakes up and they've hopefully read your book, what's the one thing you th think they should start immediately with to improve their, their, their work life, their, their code base, their approach to developing? Uh, and dependent, uh, depending on how much uh, time this uh, person who comes and yes. asks me about the thing, uh, from, a, from a, a giving a professional advice, I would usually say, just start using the tools that you have. Right? A lot of people have a lot of really cool tools like Git, their editor, uh, like their compiler, stuff like that. The things you already have at your disposal, just get to know them better. Uh, because I've seen developers who can code at 20 times speed of the other developers on the same team because they know all the shortcuts, they know all these tricks and all these methods. And by just learning the tools that we have, we can uh, already improve a lot in our productivity and in our, in our daily work. Also, the method I would recommend them for doing that would be something like ensemble programming, which I also recommend that any opportunity to people work more closely together. One flow, one team, that's it. Uh, 
and then you will start distributing this knowledge and learning new things. You can't move a team if you're completely focusing on delivering new features because you're filling your head with the feature work, right? So you can't learn a new habit, and if it's not a habit, you'll forget it when you're doing something that's cognitively difficult. So ensemble programming and then just get really good at your tools. Christian, is, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, there's a lot more I need to learn about this and read about this. <coughs> it's certainly opened my eyes to a whole kind of thing. Where can people find you on the internet? Where's a, where's a good place to, f a landing page or Twitter or where, yeah. wherever you're online? I'm on Twitter and I also have a blog that I've been uh, very bad at posting on recently, but I, I do have some articles there that I really like. Um, and yeah, on LinkedIn, on... So uh, what's your Twitter username? I'm LinkedIn. always the Dr. Lambda on every media that I'm on. The GitHub, uh, YouTube, everything. Uh, that's always me. So um, it should be fairly easy to find if Thank you so. find one of them. Thank well, you very much. Well, thanks for coming. And thanks so much for joining us here again today on Go to Unscripted in Copenhagen, where we're learning from some of the experts on all the new ways, all the new ways and the old ways being reinvented to rebuild your, rebuild your software and ultimately do a better job and hopefully enjoy it a bit more. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development.